It's time for Ask Mike Mondays. Mike answers one listener's question every week. Here's Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. Welcome to Ask Mike Mondays. I'm your host, Paul Peebles, National Underwriter for Old Capital. And guess who we have in the podcast today? The man himself, smartest guy in the room, the governor of the great state of Texas, Mr. Michael Becker. Hey, Paul. Michael, who owns so much real estate in Texas that he should be picked up in a limousine by all the, the amount of property taxes that you pay. It's the opposite of that, every, unfortunately. Every, every year. <laughs> you keep going up. I would say, how come they don't send a, a car for you, Mr. Michael? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's not what the government does. The more you pay, the, the worse they treat you, I think. <laughs> You guys pay millions of dollars and, and responsible for so many units in the great state of Texas that that's the reason why we call him the governor. So, Michael, as you know, I think manages over $650 million in assets. Is that right? That's right. Uh, you guys have bought over 7,500 units. That's right. Purchased over a billion dollars. Is it with a B? Am I saying it yeah, right? Yeah, we transacted in, as a principal in about a billion dollars in, in real estate transactions now. So, As you know, Michael spent a long period of time as a commercial real estate banker for one of the largest banks in the United States. And he went from loaning the money to knowing everybody who should be in the multifamily business. And he said, I got to get in the multifamily business because all those guys are making money. So I think I'm, I'm pretty smart. I think I can do this too. So we went from a loaner of money to an owner of real estate. So thanks for being the podcast, Michael. Yeah. What do we got going on? What's going on in the old capital world before we get going? Anything to, to be aware of? Don't forget, if you think and you find value with our podcast, Michael's and I podcast, go on to iTunes if you can and give us a five-star review and maybe a couple comments. We would appreciate that. Uh, we're always looking for positive feedback, and we appreciate anybody that spends the time to listen. If, they, you, if you could go in and make those comments also, to ask Mike Mondays, go to the old capital podcast.com, old capital podcast.com, and leave a comment for us on a, a question on what you think you need to know by asking Michael. So go in there and leave us a question. We appreciate that. And don't forget about the 17 page white paper report on multifamily financing for 2019. Again, Michael and I and James Eng spent some time kind of putting in writing what you need to know. Take our experience and try to go as fast as you can to the head of the class in financing because we make up the biggest partnership that you can find. We bring in 75, 80% of the money, get to know how we can be approved to be your lender. So in the podcast today, Michael, I see that your portfolio has grown substantially in the last few years. What is the reason for keeping third-party property management instead of it bringing in-house? Yeah, that's certainly a pretty good question. I think from what I kind of understand, the kind of rule of thumb, where I think you can really start making money doing third-party management and kind of become profitable, somewhere around 2,500 to 3,000 units under management. And that's kind of where I think that you kind of get enough economy scale to really kind of make it a, a profit center. But really for us, I'm a banker by profession and my business partner is a financial analyst. And uh, what we... Uh, what we don't have is uh, you know a whole lot of management background and and process and things like that. So we've kind of just taken the approach where we just want to focus on what we do well, which is you know identifying you know, opportunities and you know kind of putting them together and let the actual day to day management be handled by the uh, professionals. I mean, you can outsource it for pretty inexpensive, relatively speaking. I mean, you're paying two seventy five to four percent, you know, something like that, and management fee. So if you could pay someone else 3% of revenue to do it and you can charge a 1% asset management fee like we do, I can promise you the the one I get paid is better than the three they, they get paid is a whole lot of work. And so we just try to leave it to the experts, Paul. I mean, I'm just... It would also be very, very distracting for us, too, if we got fully vertically integrated, even though if you, you could hire like a president of the management company or someone with some experience to kind of run it, uh, it would you certainly kind of would bleed over more than what it does today to me. And you'd be dealing with a whole bunch of HR, city issues and things like that that the management company generally just kind of handles of the vast majority of that. It's got to be a pretty serious issue on a lot of that stuff where it bubbles up to me. Uh, and then now the way we're, we're set up is, you know, with all our units, we have, you know, professional asset manager that we have that, you know, that we employ that's got, you know, decade of experience at a large company that, you know, he can kind of come and also be a buffer in between, you know, the property management and us as principals. So as you kind of grow, we've chosen to kind of scale that way. I mean, just kind of leave it, leave it to the third party. Cause you know, the way I think about management, you know, there's really three main functions. It's accounting where they, you know, collect all your revenue, pay all your bills and give you, you know, financial reporting. 
you got uh, construction management. So they, they help either with the major CapEx projects as well as kind of just turning over units. And then the other part of the management company is really just kind of HR. So the hire and fire and discipline and you know, set direction for all the employees on site. So uh, that takes a whole lot of people because, you know, I think we're about 5,300 units today, Paul, as we record this podcast in our portfolio. And we have nine people in our company at SPI. If we were fully vertically integrated, I'd probably be closer to 150 people in uh, in our company. So no, that's 150 problems. That's right. That's right. So it's quite a bit different lifestyle that would and different set of uh, problems we would have on a daily basis. But uh, it's not that there's anything that's like wrong with being fully vertically integrated. It's just kind of what we've chosen to do, just spend our time focusing on buying high quality deals and trying to make sure we can, you know, improve financial performance of the ones that we have and just kind of make the strategic ownership decisions. Are you even thinking about it some period of time to go to your own management no, company? I, no, at this moment in time, that has zero interest to me, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I would, I, I mean, I just don't think that, especially from scratch, that'd be a very, very difficult thing. I know uh, our buddy Kenny bought into a management company. Uh, that might be something that you could potentially do and just take over someone's existing infrastructure. But to start from scratch, that sounds like a whole lot of work to me, Paul. <laughs> so if you are a new property owner and you own a 50-unit or 100-unit building, what do you think about some of these new folks having a property management company themselves? And when should you really start to think about uh, having a third-party property management company? I mean, you know, I think that for, for most of the people, I think you guys make loans to, and most of the people, I'm, all my buddies, you know, that kind of get started out in the business, you know, I think having the third-party management company makes a whole lot of sense. I mean, I, I think if you want to be serious and get vertically integrated and, and, you know, take it there, maybe when you get around 1,000 units, it might, not, it might start to make a little bit of a little bit more sense to try to do that, but it's a whole lot of work. And, you know, I think uh, obviously no one cares about your money more than you do. So I think all things being equal, being vertically integrated might be better from that perspective. But, you know, you, nothing in life is free. So if you, you have that, you have all these problems uh, you got to deal with, it's going to be at the expense of something else to do it right. So that's kind of, you know, just going to have to be the kind of the decision metric when you're making that decision, I think, is uh, if I spend a lot of time and resources on day-to-day -day management, it's going to be at the expense of something else. So you kind of already have a, a management person in-house because not only do you kind of oversee it as kind of the admiral of the ship, so to speak, you have a captain, too, that kind of oversees your portfolio, and he's an asset manager. What does he do? What role does an asset manager provide? So they're, they're kind of the main point of contact uh, in between ownership here. So myself and my partner, Sean, and the, uh, you know, operations on at our, our third-party management company. So he's there overseeing, you know, the capital projects. So they have a construction manager there, but he's kind of making sure that everything's on, on board, and then he'll aggregate all the bids. And then, you know, we have an approval process where if it gets over a certain threshold, then he comes to me to sign off on, but he's doing all the back and forth, and they bring me a, you know, a nice pretty package that takes me two minutes to review and sign off on. Uh, after they do all the legwork, um, he's also, you know, monitoring financial performance. So, you know, hey, do we have some age vacant? So we got these vacants, like these two units are sitting here for 90 days vacant. Why are they vacant? You know, and so he's like uh, monitoring stuff like that and making sure that the rental rate structures are in place and we're kind of, you know, moving them up and down as needed to, you know, capture for the upgrades or if we're spending money renovating units, we're not getting paid on it. You know, hey, should we pull back the renovations because the market's not bearing it? We're just spending money but not getting paid. And the rents, it's kind of monitoring, you know, all the kind of day to day as well as, you know, taking on property tax protests. So he's going to kind of lead up, uh, spearhead all the property tax protests with our consultant. But, you know, kind of just managing all all the stuff that you got to kind of manage. If there's a insurance claim, making sure that we get on top of that, making sure the lenders getting reported to on a timely basis, making sure that if any sort of lender required repairs are getting done, and and then generally there's always something that needs to be approved because we had you know some sewer issue or we had a boiler go out or whatever. He's he's just kind of the main point person for. If everything. you were hiring somebody, what kind of a background should that person have? You know, really, it's uh, one or two is kind of how you get into asset management. So either one, you came from operations, so you worked in a uh, property management company. It's pretty typical. Or the other way you come into it is you're like a financial analyst. And so um, you, know, you kind of have different strengths. So either either you have more of an accounting or, or finance background or you have an operational background. Those kind of usually one of the two avenues before you get into uh, asset management. 
So any other words of wisdom on uh, being self-managed versus third-party management? Yeah, no, I think they've pretty much covered most of it. I think it's, it's certainly a decision that, you know, you need to uh, take seriously because once you, uh, you're you fully vertically integrated, uh, all these problems are your your problems on the day-to-day and you got to deal with the cities and the tenants and, and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, it's going to impact uh, certainly your, your day-to-day, all your responsibilities, and, and you need to make sure you have enough redundancy in, in your, your company. Otherwise, you can never go on vacation or do anything enjoyable in life because you're stuck dealing with all the day-to-day problems. Yeah, I, I actually like that thinking because being responsible for nine people versus 109 people and having people take time off for their own vacations and having fi- having you being the responsible person to try to get that, that position covered, whether that person is sick or on vacation or whatever, I mean, that takes a lot more time on your side because everything rolls up on personnel and capital costs into these properties I mean, it, it takes away from being a good sponsor that uh, you're kind of the admiral of the navy and they don't need for you to kind of figure out what they're having for lunch on tuesday so that there's too many other bigger decisions that you should be making let the the person that specializes in management let them do it and then you go from having 109 people down to nine people and that's a lot more easy to manage and go out and find new new opportunities with new properties and raise more money. That's right. <laughs> Sounds good. So, Michael, tell us a little bit about SPI. And if- yeah, so if people want to find more information about us, the, the best way is simply go to our company's website, which is www.spiadvisor.com. It's SPI, like spyadvisor.com. And there uh, you fill out a, uh, a contact us form, fill that out. And I'm always happy to have a 10 to 15-minute telephone call with listeners of the podcast and Really what our focus uh, the rest of this year and kind of going forward, Paul, is really just kind of um, trying to f- identify high-quality opportunities and raising capital from our passive investors to put it together. And uh, that's, that's really kind of what we're focused on. And every once in a while, and I love this part of SPI, is you guys do some ability for some, some people to actually buy properties with you guys that uh, may have a large exchange five or six or seven million dollars that they want to come and go into Texas, but they may not know anybody in Texas. So they're looking for somebody that they know, like, and trust or so they can maybe partner with them. Is that something that you guys do? Yeah, we do that from time to time. Uh, we actually have quite a few assignments right now, so I don't know how much capacity I have for the next several months. But, uh, but yeah, that is definitely something that we – if you have you know, probably five million up in uh, exchange money, or you want to place it, that's probably worth having a telephone call over. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's one of the best things that you guys do is having the the capacity to partner with large sponsor people that have have the money to put into to opportunities here in Texas. So that's a great thing that SPI does, the advisory business. So again, uh, that was Michael Becker, smartest guy in the room. I'm Paul Peebles. Have a great day.